fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure the sum of every high and every low remind me once again just who I am Welcome to worship at Front Royal Presbyterian. We're so glad that you've joined us, whether you're in your kitchen or your dining room, your living room, if you're watching in your bedroom, we're glad that you've joined us in this virtual world. I hope you enjoy our worship service today. I want to thank Angela Dusenberry for assisting with liturgy. And of course, Ross and Deanne have been helping with the videoing and um, we've gotten lots of great comments. So thank you, Ross and Deanne. Uh, this week we are continuing to serve the meals every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Um, if you have some way that you'd like to help, please give us a call. If you know somebody that is in need of help delivering medicine or food or just errands, we have plenty of volunteers that are willing to help with that as well. We do hope that in the future we will be able to gather in this place again quite soon. The session will be in discussions about what we'll do in that next phase. 
expect some answers when Virginia opens to phase two. At that point, we will of course have the church, everything will be sterilized and clean and things will be a little different, but just being able to worship in God's house and see those wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ is what I am really looking forward to. So my friends, let's worship the Lord together today. Angela? The peace of Christ will be with you always. And the peace of Christ with you. Thank you, <laughs> with you. Um, so as we pass the peace, Virtually, um, I want you to invite you to look at the little chat block below the screen and greet each other on that chat block so you feel that we are together in this community.
to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who worry and want peace, to all who sin and need a savior, to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and to whoever will come, this church offers her welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are continuing our worship with our prayer of confession. Today we will focus on our failure to hold up to the promises we make to ourselves, one another, and ultimately to God. In those promises, when we speak the truth and recognize our failings, may we seek to build community at home in our community and grow our faith. So at the tolling of the bell, you are invited to pray, Lord, hear our prayer. So let us pray. Lord, we are broken. As we confess in the many ways we fail to hold our promises to one another, we also recognize that in each broken relationship, we fall out of communion, not only with one another, but also with you. Each morning, you give us a new day, full of hope and promise, and we say it will be different, that we will honor our commitments, that we will repair relationships and live into our faith, but life gets in the way. to use our words to love instead of hate, but also teach us to handle disappointment with compassionate and loving spirits, for we often hold grudges and harbor resentment when others let us down. towards repairing those places in our lives where we have lost one another's trust and where we have allowed to, further, to tear further apart the love we have for one another. community at home and in our communities, also humble us before you, O Lord, so that we may see with new eyes and fresh hearts we are called to love, serve, and be in communion with you. Amen. My friends, when we speak of promises, there is no greater promise than the one from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that when we call on his name, he will answer. When we knock on that door, he will come to our rescue. And that promise from God in the very beginning of time that we are his children, loved, beloved, and true. My friends, remember your baptism. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. go find my buddy here for our children's sermon. Maybe he'll just join me, but we'll see. Where's my pen? You need to hear. We got to talk about our, oh, yes, he's right there. I need, my there pen. he is. Uh, oh, it's underneath there. Thank you, Ross. <laughs> so, as we join with our young believers, I'm so glad that you guys are, are still joining me online, and I miss you terribly. Um, I want to ask what you guys are grateful for. Angela, what are you grateful for today? I am grateful that I get to see my family in 10 days uh, on the Outer Banks. Ah, that's, that's really just a huge blessing. Well, and that's a double blessing because you get the sun and the beach and family. So that's awesome. Thank you, Angela. Ross? I am grateful for my health 
and for my parents that are still in good standing with all this horrific illness which is going on. Yes, absolutely. Well, many of you may know that um, our family moved during this time. So I am thankful for all of the many friends that helped us because we could not get movers that helped us move. And I'm thankful for the house. Um, so um, it's been, it's good. Monty, I should have brought treats to get you to come over here. He's a little mad at me because I just, I just got, a, got on him. You want to bring him over here to me, see if he'll come? I do want to share with you guys, though, that Althea made me a bunch of masks, and I want to give them to you guys. So look at these masks. Althea made them, and then I put little faces on them. So we've got a dog face. Should we put one on Monty? Monty, come here. Hey, buddy. We've got a smile. We even have a kitty cat. Oh, no, come here. Look, how cute would it be if Monty wore a kitty? Nope, he does not like it. I, Isabel likes this one. It says, I miss you. Stay away. Um, so if you need a mask or would just like a little fun one, just let me know. So for our children's sermon today, I want to introduce you to this big fat cat who is my love bug. And he's so sweet. Now, when you introduce somebody to something, the first thing you usually do is say, this is Monty the cat. But that doesn't tell you much about him, does it? Because you already know he's a cat, and you knew his name. So, this is Monty. That's, he says, nope, that's not enough. I need more love. <laughs> so then I might tell you, this is Monty the cat, and he came from the Humane Society, and he is my friend. And that tells you a little bit about him. He's going to get up now. But it doesn't really tell you all of his story. And just those two things may not even interest you to come and say hi to Monty. But what if I told you this is Monty the cat, and we adopted him from the Humane Society, and he is a love bug. He loves to lay on my office desk, and he has a blanket, and somehow he tends to move that blanket closer to me when I'm working. He also really likes food and treats. He likes to play with his laser pointer, and he loves to be petted, so he purrs a lot. Now, those three introductions to Monty, the third one, now you might be thinking, even if you don't like cats, I may need to come meet him. And I tell you this because in our passage of scripture this morning that Angela's gonna read from Acts, is Paul is talking to a whole bunch of people that don't know Jesus. And so he has to introduce them. They have to introduce them to Jesus. Now, if Paul just said, hey, there's this guy named Jesus, do you think any of them would listen? Probably not. What if he just introduced Jesus to everybody by saying, hey, there's this guy named Jesus. He came from Nazareth, and he's a really great guy. Yeah, that might pique their interest a little, but like Monty, when you just found out he was from the Humane Society, it didn't make you really want to meet him. But then the Apostle Paul tells the Athenians all about the wonderful things about God, and then they actually start listening. So I, I tell you this because I want to ask you guys how you tell people about your church or about God or about the wonderful things in your life. If somebody says, do you go to church, and you just say, yeah, we go to Front Royal Presbyterian, that's really not going to interest them that much, maybe. But if you tell them, oh, we go to Front Royal Presbyterian, and it's so much fun, and we love the worship, and oh my gosh, the choir is amazing, and we get to hear the Word of God, and children's worship gets me excited. See? Now people might be a little more excited about coming to church and meeting God the first time. So that's what Paul has to teach us this morning, and I want to encourage you, even though you're home, to think of ways that you can tell other people about God, not just by saying his name, but by telling all the wonderful things that he does for you. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we love you, and we thank you that you have gifted us with this church, with this community, and with the love and fellowship of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for the children. Keep them safe. Keep them entertained. 
Let them understand that, that this is a different time, that things might be scary, but that you remain through your son's name. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for the offering, here are a few thoughts that I would like you to consider. We continue in these difficult and stressful times to be the church here at Front Royal Presbyterian. You have heard the many ways this church continues to feed, serve, and love our vulnerable neighbors and our friends. This is particularly important now that most of us cannot actively participate in the work of our church, in the community, while we, while we are sheltering at home, but we can participate by supporting the church financially as we are able. So when we pray, your kingdom come, we are reminded that each one of us has a role to play in making this kingdom a, a reality right here on earth. Thank you to all of you who have already given sacrificially to support this kingdom work. We now invite you to continue your giving. You can do this either via tithely.com, tithes.ly.com, or by sending a check to the church each of you as you are able. And remember that all that we have comes from God's hand, and we are each individually blessed in order to be a blessing to others. It is like he fills your cup, and you fill this cup. Now, now in the chat section below, you are invited to share today in worship ways in which you are offering your time and service during this time. As you, as you are able, so that we may see the wonderful ways in which God is using you to further his kingdom. So enjoy this video from the skit guys. <laughs> give to God by enjoying what he has given me, okay? I mean, do you really think he expects something back? Now, I know there's a lot of people at church that would not understand this line of reasoning. That's why, just to make things simple and not to cause any controversy, I like to carry what I call the little empty envelope, all right? You see, when the plate gets passed, I bloop, put it in there like that. The deacon's counting the money. They only know me as the crazy empty envelope guy, but the people sitting around me, clueless. <laughs> I win, they win, God wins. No one gets hurt because no one knows. God knows. Huh? Let me ask you a question, huh? How's your mutual fund? Hey, for that matter, how's all your funds? Ha has the fun left your funds, huh? Has your do re me taken a W-A-L-K, huh? <laughs> what if I told you that I knew about an investment you could make that the return would be mind-boggling? And, 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 it's, and it's promised, it's guaranteed. I know what you're saying, there's no guarantees. This one's guaranteed, okay? Malachi 3.10, so what it says in the Old Testament, it says, test me, give to God, and he will give you back. It goes like this, I give this, he gives this. I give this, he gives this. I give this, up right up there, he keeps giving. I can't outgive God, how crazy is that? <laughs> Do I love him? Sure, whatever. I'm just saying, if you give, he gives back. <laughs> I tithe but just not like in the form of a 10% check per se. Let me tell you what I mean. When I go to church on a Sunday morning, they're selling donuts, I buy some, boom, that's a tithe. When my whole Sunday school class wants donuts and I, out of the goodness of my heart, buy a whole bunch for the Sunday school class, boom, that's another tithe. But it's not about me spending money. It's about the smile on people's faces. That, my friends, is tithe enough for me. Case in point, the church was having date nights where we could take our spouse out for an evening, and they were charging $25 for child care. Boom shakalaka tithe. But I'll tell you what the biggest tithe was. When I spent over $100 on our meal, and my wife was grinning ear to ear, that, my friends, a tithe. I, w I would like to give. I would, okay? But everything right now is just... Crazy. I mean, just crazy, you know? I mean, not normal crazy, really crazy, you know? And if after I paid my bills and took care of the things that I need and want, then I would, I would consider giving something, but not, now is crazy. We're, we're, we're going to give later. We've already talked about it. I mean, down the road, we'll be crazy givers, but right now, it's just crazy. 
Yeah, I have money, that's a fact. But you know what, it's a heart thing between me and the Lord and the pastor because he needs to know what I'm giving now that we have this little building campaign going on, if you know what I'm saying. And pastor, I'd give a little bit more. I'd give a little something, something if you'd have that music minister sing a couple more hymns now and then, huh? Hey, what's this, watch this. Is that a Benjamin? I think it is. Benji likes hymns. Come on. You want it? Ah, come on, Pastor. Do what I say, huh? Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> oh, in my life, Lord, be glorified in me. I put money in the plate. Wait, wait, wait. Look what I have here. I hope it doesn't interfere. But that everyone can hear how I give with cheer That everyone could be like me Jazz hands! <laughs> My friends, let us pray. Good and gracious God, we know that you fill our cups to overflowing. We are reminded as we look around that we, though we may be in fear of the unknown, Lord, we are still safe and healthy and we are blessed. And so you call us to be a blessing to others. Help us, Lord, to be cheerful givers. Bless the gifts that come into this place, whether they, it is money or whether it is a gift of time. Bless them to bring about your kingdom through your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. And here Paul presents Christ to the Athenians in a way that we can all learn from. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
lesson today comes to us from John 14, uh, verses 15 through 21, and this is coming right after that wonderful passage where Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to prepare a place for them, that, that I have a room for you, and I have a mansion, it has lots of rooms, and I will take you to where I am. And this is Jesus now speaking in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it never sees him nor knows him. You know him because you, he abides with you and he is in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you in a little while. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and I am in me and in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them and will, will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from a Father who sent me. My friends, the prophet Isaiah reminds us each and every time we read scripture that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, you remind us each and every day that your word is eternal. Yet we don't depend on it as we should. We don't turn to it each and every moment. So as we, Lord, hear your word today, may it be yours and not mine. May the words that I speak merely be a message from you to us, your children, in this world. Through your son's name, amen. I really appreciate all of the um, those that are helping with worship, and I want to thank uh, a special thank you to Mark Jordan for helping out last week. It was um, wonderful that on Mother's Day I got to sit in our family room or, or the office and watch worship with them and see Mark, and he had a fantastic sermon. So thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody else who helps us with worship. I'm going to talk a little bit today about this unknown God that Angela spoke about. And before I do that, I want to talk about sermons in general. It, you may not know it, but in our very first preaching and worship class there in seminary, one of the first things that we were taught was you can't preach the same sermon in every church because each congregation is different. So you can't repeat a sermon over and over and over again because they're in a different place, in a different time. The important thing that we were told is you've got to find that common ground. Some common ground where you can begin that conversation. And this has been very hard in the past for me as I've preached in Mexico and Haiti and in Ethiopia. And I wonder how in the world do I find a common ground with people whose lives are so vastly different than mine. But the Apostle Paul actually gives us some hints. But it, it's hard because in Haiti and in Ethiopia, not so much in Mexico, they don't believe that women should be preachers. So me just stepping up into a pulpit in all my femaleness and loudness puts people off. So all of a sudden there's this barrier that people are like, yeah, I can't listen to that. But I want you to hold on to that because that's what Paul is dealing with, with the Athenians. Paul is in a place in Athens and he has to preach to the Athenians. Now you gotta understand that before Paul preaches, 
He walks around the entire, uh, entirety of Athens, and as he does, he looks around and he sees all these monuments and all of these statues, each and every one of them dedicated to a different god. And so as he does this, he's finding common ground. But we know that Paul has one god, and the Athenians have this vast array. And then Paul's eye catches on a monument or statue that says to an unknown God. And that's where Paul says, aha. And then when he starts to speak to them, he says in a wonderful way, I see that you are very religious. You, the Athenians, are extremely religious in every way. So he starts with a compliment. You know, some of those funny TV shows, I can't remember, I think it was How I Met My Mother said, you know, in order to break up with something, you have to do the compliment sandwich. You have to do a compliment, and then you tell the, the, the bad news, and then you give another compliment. Well, the Apostle Paul is starting his compliment sandwich by saying, I see that you are very religious in every way. And I wonder what Paul would say to us if he were to, to come down to Front Royal, and he were to walk around our town, he wouldn't see the obvious gods and statues that he saw in Athens. But I have a feeling that he would still look around and see all sorts of different things that are not of the God that we proclaim to worship. He would see that unknown God in our lives, in our, in our families. It's the God of the gap. It's the God of the insurance policy. It's the God that you turn to that, that just in case. You, what I call it is the belts and suspenders God. You know, if you wear belts, then your pants should stay up. If you put on suspenders, you've got a backup. That unknown God is the backup God. And that's what they're doing in, in, in Athens. They, they have all these other gods, but just in case they missed one, we got our fail safe. To an unknown God. There's a massive shift here in the church in the mid to late 90s. And I remember it because it was high school, college for me at that time. Well, less high school and more college. But the shift that happened during that time was people were deciding that the church was no longer a source of authority in their lives. There was this great shift where people actually were told, told people that they were spiritual, but not religious. I think that's important. Spiritual, but not religious. And what happened is a decline in church, in many churches, Sunday school classes didn't attend anymore, worship attendance went down, and even today, if you were to go out and poll people in our own Warren County, you would probably hear them say, I'm more spiritual than religious. And sometimes I can get behind that because sometimes our religiousness becomes too overwhelming. It becomes too rule following. It becomes too weighty. But what happens next? When you decide that you're more spiritual than religious and you, then you step away from the community of faith, what happens is you get what we call a Christian buffet. Put it this way. Chinese. Everybody loved, do you like Chinese food, Ross? Good answer. Because if you said no, I was going to have to, you know, come up with another one. Chinese buffet. If you go to a Chinese buffet, you get a whole assortment of anything and everything, don't you? You got General Zoe's chicken, you got orange chicken, you got sesame chicken, you got cashew chicken, you got shrimp and um, asparagus stir fry, you got white rice, fried rice, brown rice. You've got quite the buffet before you. And when you look at that, you get to pick and choose what you like. You see where I'm going with this. But the interesting thing is that in those buffets, those Chinese buffets, a lot of that food is not really authentic Chinese food. It's some sort of mixture, Americanized Chinese food that if you were to go to China, I'm not quite sure you'd find the same. Spiritual but not religious. With that Christian buffet, what happens is we look at this buffet of all the things before us and when we have no rock on which to stand, we pick and choose 
and we decide who we are. So I am now the supreme authority over my faith. Not God, not church, not anything. I am. And that's a dangerous shift because it puts that on me and it lets me have the power and the control. And I tell you this because Paul is preaching to Athens and they believe that they are in control. That's what they got all those gods. They've got their belts and suspenders God. They've got them all. And the Apostle Paul says in his compliment sandwich, I see that you are very religious. And they were overly religious to an extreme, very religious with their God of belts and suspenders. And so as, as Paul is talking to the Athenians, people actually begin listening to him, which is important. Because once they started listening to him, they said, let's take you, Paul, up to the Areopagus. And that's a big, that's a big compliment. That's like the lifetime opportunity. It's like the, a musician getting told they get to play in Carnegie Hall or an artist saying their, their art is going to hang in the Louvre in France, or, or a rock star getting to go to the Emmys. You know, see, it's the, a lifetime opportunity. It's the place to be. And that's where they go to listen to the Apostle Paul. And the other thing you need to realize is that the Athenians, in this time and in this place, they were filled with all sorts of different beliefs, and their philosophies were very different than our trish, Christian tradition, which was just starting, of course. Their philosophies were the Stoics and the Epicureans, and, and there was a lot of belief that the God, God is the universe, God is all of these things, that individual atoms make up everything, and God is in every, every individual atom. All of these different things that the philosophers were thinking was what they were then believing. But the other important thing is, is that the church there in Athens was a church that would have been, or, or not a church, a belief system, that would have been answering to Caesar. And that's important. Because when we answer to Caesar, when we look at that fact that we're worshiping Caesar, what's happening is we start living too much in the world. Because that worship became a worship of victimology. There were victors and there were victims. There were people that were accepted and there were people that were not accepted. The race chose your worth and your worth was based on where you grew up or, or how much money you have or what neighborhood you lived in. Some were victors and some were victims. And that's a dangerous theology. Sadly, one that we know too familiar lately. When we treat others as less than ourselves. Your value being equated to how much your worth financially is in society. This is a dangerous dogma to get into. And I love that, that later when Paul speaks to the church at, and in Galatians, he says there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. So all of a sudden, all of that is broken down. The book of Acts, though, has a fun way of telling the story. I love it. Paul even has a tongue-in-cheek comment when he says that you who would spend your time uh, in nothing but telling and hearing something new. You who would spend your time in telling or hearing about something new. Because philosophers, they, you know, they talk around things. Philosophers are the ones that say, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? You know, I'm not a philosopher. But that's who, that's who Paul is talking about. And it's important to remember, too, that Socrates was one of these. And if you know so Socrates, he was actually put, he was condemned for corrupting Athens with strange new gods. That's dangerous, because Paul's walking into a place that has lots of gods. And he's about to introduce them to a new one. The philosophers weren't priests or prophets. Remember, they're thinkers. They, they just kind of think and talk around things. So here, 
is your audience. Here are the people that were listening. And so their ears started perking up and they invited him to speak, but he wasn't safe just yet. Paul was on shaky ground, really shaky ground. But he must have been listening in his preaching class because first he found that common ground. Using the cultural knowledge he knew of Athens, in the passage of scripture that Angela read, he quotes two Greek prophets, poets. In him we live and move and have our being, probably from Epimenides. Epimenides, somebody can correct me down that later. Sixth century. Second, we are his offspring. And that one probably came from Eris. Now, you and I claim those to be scripture, but the Apostle Paul is finally getting in there in common ground with the people using their tradition, where they have come from, what they understand, to open up a way for, to introduce them to Christ. So as he does that, as he talks about them being religious, and as he talks about these different poets, he begins to break down barriers. And, and all of a sudden, they start breaking apart, and they start to listen. It was a chance of a lifetime for Paul. And here he was. Here he was. And, and once he got that little chink in his armor, once he got just one step closer to them, actually listening to them, he throws in the big guns. What therefore you worship in ignorance, he's speaking about the unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I announce to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, he being Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, neither is he served by men's hands as though he needed anything seeing he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. And they listened. I love that, 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 that verse in, after many of the parables. It says, and those that had ears to hear, they heard. Those that had ears to hear, they heard that day. Not very many. But the ground was broken because Paul found that common place. He met them where they were. And what message does that give us today in this strange new world that we live in? We are offended by everything. Everything. Somebody is always offended and needs to go away. You're offended because your neighbor has a different political party sign on their front yard. You're offended because somebody didn't wear red on Wear Red Monday. You're offended because of this, that, or the other. And so with all of these offenses in between us and in our communities, all of a sudden we start putting up those barriers. And we have little and little in common and less common ground. So how do we engage this marvelously diverse culture in which we live? Because it is marvelous. A beautiful thing that has happened with all of this is that, that we tolerate all other religions. And that's a great thing. It's because then that we tolerate them, that we don't have this persecution, that we don't say that one is better than the other. That there's no reason to turn down a job because somebody is of a different faith tradition. That is great. It's tolerance. But we have to be careful of acceptance. Accepting is absolutely wonderful. But Christ does put down the line. He does say in the passage of John that I just read, if you love me, you will heed my commandments. If you love me, you will listen to what I have to say. Ultimately, you know, when it comes down to it, Christ is right there in the middle. It's good to be tolerant. It's good to accept others, absolutely. But the thing that we must learn from Paul this morning is we need to find some common ground. And this is what I love. And this is why I introduced you to Monty this morning. Because Paul is up there and he says, What therefore you worship as an unknown God, this I proclaim to you. In other words, just like I introduced Monty, let me introduce you to Monty. 
let me introduce you to the unknown God. And it could have ended there. Nobody would have gotten anything. Just like if I just said Monty's name. Let me introduce you. But he doesn't stop. He goes forward. It's kind of like, it's kind of, do you have a $20 bill on you? I'm not going to keep it. But do you have a $20 bill? I'm making Ross give me money. That's great, isn't it? If he doesn't, that's okay. Uh, Dan took all his money. Don't worry about it. So if I had a $20 bill right now, and this is what Paul might say to us here today. If I had a $20 bill right now and look on it, Paul would say, I see this $20 bill that most of you carry around in your pockets, apparently not Ross or me. Um, and it says, in God we trust. So where you spend that money tells a story. It, in God we trust. But, but where you're spending that money doesn't tell me much about the God that you trust. It doesn't tell me about the God that made the world. It doesn't tell me about all of those different things that God does for you in your life. Let me introduce you to him. Because you might be a little confused. And I love that. In God we trust. Where do we spend our money? Where are we putting our faith and our, our, our belief and our, our whole being in God? Let me introduce you. We Christians, we're, we're really bad at this, especially Presbyterians, you know, frozen chosen and all. We're really bad about introducing God to the community around us. We're really bad at linking God to our lives and what we do and why we do it. We're really bad at explaining that we give into the dinner together because we want to feed the hungry. Not because that makes me feel better. We're really bad at it as Christians. We're really bad at introducing God. God is everything, Paul says. He made the world. He is the world. He is in all things. God doesn't live in shrines or in the idols that you guys have all over here. God does not live there, and I dare say he does not live within this church or that church, or that church, or the Catholic church, or the Mormons, or the, uh, the Baptists. He doesn't live there. He is everywhere. And, and the, one of my very favorite quotes right now in this time is, the church is not closed, it's been deployed. I love that. The church is not closed, it's been deployed. Because the church is the people, are the people out there that are doing and being the word of God. The church is not closed, it's been deployed. It's as if Paul is saying to the Athenians, no longer can you live just to yourself. No longer can you go to this Christian buffet and just pick and choose what you like. No longer is that the way that God would have you live. Now, what you believe actually matters. And that's pretty awesome. What you do in this world matters. What you live for, it matters. Righteousness matters. Justice matters. And that is the God that loves you, that calls you to that. If you love me, you will follow my commandments. Getting to what is right and what is good, it matters. So no longer do we live to ourselves because that will only lead to destruction. We live to God. May we know what this new teaching is, which is spoken to us. That's Acts 17, 19. So they were listening. May we know what this new teaching is, which is spoken by you. And the danger is, those philosophers, if given time, would sit around and talk and talk and talk in circles about it and do nothing about it. And sadly, sometimes the church does the same thing. We sit around in circles and talk and talk and talk about it, but we do nothing. Given time, they might have actually even developed a whole new series of books. But the thing was, is that by doing that and just talking about it, they were unwilling to yield themselves to God's grace. They were unwilling to let down that barrier to the way God is calling them to live in the world. If we're generous, maybe Paul, half a dozen heard him that day and actually believed. Half a dozen, that's six. He would have spoken to a huge crowd. Six people, and that's being generous. 
However, here's the neat story about this. Dionysius happened to be one of the most revered men of Athens. He had a home right there on the Areopagus, so he was valued and worthy in the culture. He was respected, and when Paul left, he went on to Corinth, and he, and he went on, but it was Dionysius that took Paul's message and held on to it. And in time, as God let that seed spread, the whole city, he brought the whole city to faith in Jesus Christ. And this is what the plaque says. Sometime in the middle of the first century A.C., the Apostle Paul is said to have converted a number of Athenians by teaching the tenets of a new religion from the summit of the hill, that would be the Areopagus. Among the converts was Dionysius, the patron saint of the city of Athens, who according to tradition was the city's first bishop. Remains of a church in his honor are preserved on the northern slope of the hill. How did he do it? He didn't just give them a name. When he asked, when you and I are asked where we worship, do we just say Front Royal Presbyterian? Or do we say, I worship in this place where brothers and sisters in Christ come and build one another up and have fellowship? He introduced them to an unknown God, not by criticizing their way of life, not by getting in their face with all sorts of things, but by finding that common ground. So how do you do that? When you speak to somebody whose faith is different than yours, do you walk up to them and when they say they are, are, are Jewish, you say, oh, well, you're not Christ, you're wrong. Or can you find some common ground? When you walk up to somebody who believes or thinks something different politically than you do, do you immediately step up and put that barrier up or do you find common ground? And I think that's the message that Paul is telling us. We have to put ourselves out there. And if anybody did, it was Paul on that day. We don't ask if, if you're right and I'm wrong. We stand in a place of Christian community. And then when the barriers are down, and you're sitting in a place of comfort and peace, you introduce them to the God of everything. The God who made the entire world and all that is in it. The God who stuck with us even though we have turned away from him a thousand times more. The God who ultimately gave his son so that you and I might live. The God who rose up from the dead, who conquered death, defeated the big death and so that you and I might live with him. The God that in the Gospel of John says, I am going to prepare a place for you. So when you introduce them to that God, when you step and you find some common ground, you know, Paul only had six believers that day. Maybe you'll have none. But the promise is that when you plant that seed, God will give the growth. When given the opportunity, and it's always there, believe me, whether it's on the hill of Areopagus or in your living room or in a cubicle at the office or you know, at the supermarket, wherever it is, what are you gonna say? Even, dare I say, on Facebook. Are we going to criticize? Are we going to put them off? Or are we going to find that common ground so that we can then reveal the living God? What do you have to say about that unknown God that we call God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Amen and amen. My friends, as we go to prayer this, more, this evening, morning, day, night, whenever you're watching, I want to remember um, quite a few people in our prayers. Melissa Horton lost a dear friend to COVID, and we continue to keep her in our prayers. We keep Richard Johansson in our prayers. We pray for those that are unable to be with their loved ones, whether it's because they're sick with COVID or just in the hospital. Ray Jewell came to see me yesterday and he said his grandmother's not doing well, so we keep her in our prayers. My friends, let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. 
Lord, you are the giver of all things. You are the one that made the entire universe and world. You are the one that saw it fit to say, oh, Carrie, I need you here. Ross, I need you here. And we have failed to be who you've called us to be. So fill us once again. Open our ears and our eyes, our hearts, and all of who we are so that we can see the commonality between us, so that we can find a common ground and talk and share and proclaim the gospel. Lord, you are the giver of all life, and you are the great physician, as we are told in the gospels. And in this time of crisis and pandemic, in this time of fear and uncertainty, we beg you, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come. And when we say that, we say that knowing that that is also our responsibility to be a part of that. So help us, Lord, to find that place that is safe so that we can become a community once again in this place and in all places. Help those that are working on a cure to find answers. Help those that are in the hospitals be safe. Be with those, Lord, that live in fear, those, Lord, that haven't left their house for three months, those that haven't been home to see their families in three months, those that work and serve in the midst of a very dangerous situation, Lord, be the great physician. Lord, we ask your blessing on Ray's grandmother. Heal her and, and her heart and bring her home. We continue to ask your blessing on your good and faithful servant, Richard Johansson, whom we love dearly. Give him strength each and every day. For those who grieve, Lord, like Melissa and Heidi, the Cook family, the Perry family, the Up Churches, Lord, those that grieve and walk through that dark valley, be with them and speak to them of your resurrection truth. Lord, as your church, we have been deployed. Gathering for worship in this space is not the same. So encourage us in different ways to be the church. Encourage us in safe ways to be the community that you've called us to be. Show us your path and, and tear down the barriers that we put up in front of us. Empower us, Lord, and may you give us courage. And, and if, it, if it be so, break us down, Lord, so that we can hear you. You say, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. So we profess that we love you each and every other day. What do our actions show? Lord, this world is in great pain. And in this unknown time, we have leaders that are trying their best to do what is right, what is good, what is safe. Guide them, Lord. Give them wisdom. Give them the courage to stand up against those that they think are doing something wrong. Help them, help them to perceive and, and give way to your spirit in their minds so that they might get out of the way and that you might truly lead from every office in the land and in the world. Lord, we ask you to be with those that are not with their families. Our military, who, who in the midst of all of this crisis are still overseas and defending our country, bless them, Lord, keep them safe. For first responders that, that put on the badge each and every day and walk out into a community that may or may not be riddled with germs, keep them healthy. And for all of those that are vulnerable among us, Lord, the hungry, the homeless, the elderly, the children that have no parents, Lord, find them, bring them to us, use our hands and feet to serve and love. For teachers, Lord, they're having to find new and amazing ways to reach out to their kids. For students that literally now crave that classroom so they can literally be beside their friends. For teenagers that are missing their boyfriends and girlfriends and best friends. For, for children who don't get to see their, their elderly parents. 
and for families that live within a household for a long time with no break. Lord, hear our prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My blessing to you is to listen to the Apostle Paul. In your life, in your world, introduce somebody to the God of all of creation. Wherever you go, wherever you might be, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.